Hey, y'all. Come on. How you doing, bud? Hey. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks for this cool fall day, and we give you thanks for all the love in our hearts and for all the people in this room. And we ask your blessing on everyone, on everyone here and everyone worshiping with us online and everyone that we love, and give us happy hearts as we run and skip and jump to Children's Chapel today. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. All right, y'all have fun. We'll see you on the other side. Well, good morning, St. John's. Yes, it is a good morning. So um, the first thing I have to say in this sermon is very important, and that is this. I hereby call this meeting to order. I'll explain in a little bit why I have to say that. Uh, First things first, though, um, we have a message from our missionaries to the Cuba uh, mission trip. So this says um, they are in Zaria. They've all made it. Uh, all are healthy and well. Everything's going great. Did, they did a program with the kids yesterday, and most importantly, they are desperate to know who won the FSU Miami game. <laughs> so uh, Katie says that she has emailed photos, so we'll be posting those fairly soon, and go Knowles. Um, So as we have embarked on our year of the Bible this year here at St. John's, we have made the claim over and over and over that we believe here at this church that the Bible, at its core, is fundamentally a love story. Even when it does not feel that way, even when we muddle through whole stories and chapters and books of the Bible that seem to focus only on war or judgment or sin, Our claim here at St. John's Episcopal Church is that when you take the Bible as a whole, when you read the entire story, the Bible is fundamentally a love story. And that is a choice that we make. You can decide how you are going to interpret the Bible and how you are going to use it. Some people might use it as a weapon. We use it as a source and force for love. Love story from God to all of humanity. And after slogging through some really tough books here lately, like Joshua and Judges, today we land on a book that feels so much nicer, so much lighter, so much more lovely. Today we have landed on the book of Ruth. In fact, the book of Ruth is so lovely that in many denominations, one of the passages you heard earlier is often quoted at weddings. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your people shall be my God. That's so nice. That's so pretty. The thing that they don't tell you at weddings is that's not uh, like a bride and a groom saying that to one another. That is a widowed daughter-in-law saying that to her mother-in-law. And I would love to see what would happen if we did weddings here and had like the uh, daughter-in-law say that to the new mother-in-law and just see what happens. (laughs) But make no mistake, the book of Ruth is not about namby-pamby, googly-eyed, sweet, and saccharine love. This book is about real love, love with a capital L, love that changes lives, love that makes room for difference and accepts people for who they are, love that some have called bulldozer love because it has the power to tear down the walls that we so love to create within our societies. Because here's the thing. Before Ruth is anything else in this story, Ruth is an outsider. The writers of this story, these four short, compact, beautiful little chapters, this tiny little book in the whole Bible, the writers of this story go to great pains to make sure that you know at the outset that Ruth is a foreigner which meant that she was on the outside. Everything that we've read up to this point in the Bible makes it sound like if you're outside, then you're out of luck. And so Ruth is a foreigner. And not only is Ruth a foreigner, but she's a Moabite, which was bad news back then. And not only is she a Moabite, but she's a Moabite woman, 
which means that she has very little power. And not only is she a Moabite woman, but she is a Moabite widow woman, which means she's really out of luck and really on the outside. She does not belong in this story if all you're going on is everything we've read so far. So I cannot express to you enough how much of a caricature Ruth is in this story of everything that Jewish people were not supposed to be. Think in your head of the kind of person that you really don't like and who really gets on your nerves and who is totally opposed to everything that you like and comes from all the wrong places and all the wrong family. And you might sit there and say, well, no, but I have love in my heart. I don't think of anybody that way. Yes, you do. Whoever that person is, that's Ruth. Ruth is way, way, way on the outside. Over and over and over in the last few books of the Bible, it has been made repeatedly clear that once the Israelites entered the promised land, they were not to intermarry with foreigners. Yet here Ruth is, a foreigner who intermarried with her Jewish husband who is now dead, And all her mother-in-law Naomi wants is to get rid of her, but she cannot shake her loose because, honestly, Ruth has nowhere to go, and somehow God intends for their lives to be bound together. Y'all, the miracle of the book of Ruth is that it even exists at all. Because for all we might hear in the Bible about war and sin and purity and division and guilt and shame, God's heart is in this book is made clear that it is truly geared toward those on the side, those on the margins, those on the underbelly, those without hope. And God always intends to break down the walls and bring the outsiders in. Our Jewish forebears who put the Bible together, especially the the Old Testament in particular, They were way more comfortable than most Americans with cognitive dissonance, with putting two things together that seemed to be in conflict. And so think about all those years ago when those Jewish rabbis, who were probably all dudes, sitting around the table and saying, fellas, we got to decide which books we're going to keep in on this this, this." Uh, Bible that we're creating here and they said well we got to have Genesis you know we got to have Exodus Leviticus Numbers Deuteronomy we got to have Joshua all full of all that stuff about purity and division and not hanging out with the outsiders and we got to have judges that's got to keep that in there and one of those dudes said yeah but fellas we got to have Ruth we got to have Ruth the story about the outsider who was brought in we got to have Ruth, the story of the one through whom God worked, even though she didn't belong in the story. And they said, yeah, we do need that because that will give us the fuller, more comprehensive picture of who God is. It is no mistake that this story of an outsider is in our Bible. Now, you heard me say at the beginning of this sermon that I bring this meeting to order. That is because yesterday we had our long overdue diocesan convention. It was supposed to happen in February. It was postponed, postponed, finally happened yesterday. And I am actually technically required by the canon law of the diocese to hold a parish meeting and give you a recap of what happened yesterday. So this is that meeting. We're also required to have you vote at this time for two new convention delegates, and I'll get to that in a second. So here's the recap of convention. I know you were excited to come here today and hear this. Number one, you need to know that Jonathan Jackson, Kelly Kirby, and Pam Jordan Anderson and I attended on your behalf, and all the things that happen at a diocesan convention happened. People were elected to various committees and positions. The budget was shared in exquisite, excruciating detail, which is good because they are trying to be as transparent as possible and make sure that we know all that we want to know and then some. And I actually really appreciated that. Uh, I, if you heard rumors that I might have been on my phone at that time, right around 3.36 with an AirPod in, uh, watching kickoff, um, you weren't there, you don't know, maybe that happened, maybe it didn't. <laughs> but the other ear was open to everything else that was going on. 
Lots of resolutions were proposed. One really great resolution about becoming beloved community, which is intended to help us in our continued journey toward racial reconciliation, that was passed and it's a really great thing. Uh, most of the other, other resolutions, which were changes to the diocesan and canons, were set aside for this year after considerable conversation. Here's what you need to know the most. Um, our bishop, Bishop John Howard, retired on October 31st, which means that as of November 1st, our diocese is being run by the Standing Committee, which is an elected body of both clergy and lay leaders representing the whole diocese. You can think of it kind of like the vestry for the diocese. And so in the absence of a bishop, they are the ecclesiastical authority. Uh, they are doing their best to manage the diocese. And I have to say that after yesterday, after listening to a phenomenal sermon by our friend, Father Hugh, from over at St. Michael and All Angels, he, he uh, celebrated and preached the opening Eucharist, and it was a phenomenal sermon about what it means for our diocese to go forward in love. And after listening to what our uh, standing committee president and incoming president had to say, I have hope, because as you may know, there's been considerable division in this diocese over the last few years. And I could get into all the reasons, I know, buddy, it, it's, it's sad. I, I could get into all the reasons for why there are those divisions. What it really comes down to is trust and transparency. When you don't get people together in the same room and have them talking, where some may be conservative, some may be progressive, some are in the middle, if we're not getting together, trust can quickly begin to crumble. And I think that's a huge part of what's happened in the diocese over the past several years. So there was a lot of talk yesterday about no longer having insiders or outsiders, but finding ways forward in love and transparency. Don't ask me when we're gonna elect a new bishop. I don't know, they don't know, only the Holy Spirit knows. What we know right now is that in the Episcopal Diocese of Florida, we need to be getting together and forming those bonds of trust, transparency, and love because electing a bishop, as we've seen over the past year and a half, does not work if you don't have trust and transparency and love. And so in January, there's going to be a special convocation, sort of a mini convention, which will be a next good step toward bringing us together, where representatives of all the congregations will be able to get together and talk about what's on their hearts and listen and hear one another. And we're gonna be led through that by a bishop named Mary Gray Reeves, who is highly skilled and renowned in the Episcopal Church for conflict resolution. And she had a word that she sent to us by video. I know that here at St. John's, we typically don't really feel the effects of what's going on in the diocese. We're one of our larger churches, and because of that, you might not always really know or hear about or feel what's going on, but make no mistakes, y'all. You are Episcopalians. Episcopalians are connectional Christians. We believe that we're in this together. We believe that what happens over at St. Michael's and at Advent and at Holy Comforter and at Grace Mission and all the way over to all the churches on the eastern side of the diocese, we believe that what happens there affects us and what happens to us affects them because we love each other. That's what it means to be Episcopalians and not Congregationalists. And here's the thing about St. John's. Y'all, we, we know how to band together despite our differences. We've done it many times before. We continue to do it all the time. We know what it is to hope and to love even if we don't agree. We've done it before. We continue to do it all the time. And we know what it means to have a witness to bear, love to offer, and grace to give. We've done it before. We do it all the time. And so there is considerable strength in our love, trust, and transparency here that I'm hoping can be contagious for the whole rest of the diocese as we continue to love them and help them and we get to know them and they us. And so I have two requests of you. One is, if you are interested at all in being a part of the larger life of the diocese, talk to me. I'd love to help you figure out how to do that because we need to be involved together across the diocese. My other request is this. Pray for the Episcopal Diocese of Florida. It's your home. It's your church. 
your church is bigger than these four walls, and we have a lot of work to do to draw our circle wider and to get rid of the uh, dividing walls that make insiders and outsiders. We need to be one. You can be part of that, and part of how you do that is by praying for our brothers and sisters across the diocese, and especially for the standing committee as they lead. Now, here's the fine print. As part of all of this, I am also required to tell you that today we will open an election to select two convention delegates who will represent St. John's at the annual diocesan conventions in 2022 and 2025. Normally we do this at our uh, annual meeting early in the year, but because convention got postponed, we're having to do it now. You just got to love the technicalities of Episcopal canon law. I see how much you love it. I can read it on your faces right now. You will only be voting on convention delegates. Uh, vestry will happen next year's regular parish meeting. You may vote via paper ballot out in the breezeway after the service today, or stop by the front office this week during business hours to cast your ballot, or vote electronically using the link in your chimes because we are hip and with it and up with the times. Voting will close next Sunday, November 19th, and the vestry will then tally the ballots and announce our new convention delegates. In order to vote, you must be a communicant in good standing, which means you must be a baptized and confirmed member of this parish, have been a member for at least six months, and give regularly. And if you have any questions about these qualifications, please don't hesitate to ask the office. <sighs> okay. Back to Ruth. A couple weeks ago, I showed you all in the St. John's Bible the gorgeous illumination of the genealogy of Jesus as it's contained at the very beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. And I pointed out to you Rahab, who is in this genealogy, because it's interesting that she's in there because she was a woman and she was an outsider. Well, guess who else is in this genealogy? Old Sister Ruth. There she is, right there. Because as we hear at the very end of the book of Ruth, not only is Ruth an outsider who's brought in, but she's brought in so deeply into the life of the community that when she finally has a son, all the women of the village rejoice and surround her, and they're so excited for her and for Naomi. And then that son has a son, and that son has a son. And ultimately, who comes forward from the line of Ruth? King David. And who ultimately comes forth from the line of King David? Well, Jesus himself. And so, y'all, today's a day when you came to church not knowing what to expect, and you got some canon law thrown at you, and I'm sorry for that. But you also got the good news that God can take anybody. If you have ever felt like you are on the outside of the circle, your God is a God who is all about crushing the dividing walls, building us up with love, and using people just like you to bring his redemption about in the world. Congratulations, y'all. I mean, like, that was worth the price of it. Testify, brother, I know. So the book of Ruth is not about namby-pamby, googly-eyed, sweet and saccharine love, and neither is our life as Episcopalians or as Christians. The life you and I live is about real love. Love with a capital L, love that changes lives, love that makes room for differences and accepts people for who they are, love that some have called bulldozer love because it's the kind of love that has the power to tear down the walls that divide us. It's the kind of love that people are starved for, and y'all, we know how to offer it. So I'll close with this. All this week as I've been thinking about the book of Ruth, and all day yesterday as I listened at convention, I thought of a simple little poem that I once heard by the American poet Edwin Markham. It goes like this. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. But love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Y'all, our Bible is a love story. And it turns out God is always in the business of drawing the circle wider and wider and wider. So in the spirit of Ruth and Naomi, in the spirit of Jesus, in the spirit of hope, let's join in and keep drawing new circles wider and wider. Let's do it for the sake of love. Amen.
and meeting adjourned. Standing as you are able, let us reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, found on page 358. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, 